trabajo. Yeah, Honorable Ruto, it, VAT on, um, on petroleum products was indeed controversial. Let me take you back to 2013 when um, VAT was imposed on this as a condition by IMF. At the time, uh, majority, then majority leader Adam Duale said, and I quote, the 181 members have been convinced by our party leader and our deputy party leader on the rationale of 8% VAT on petroleum products. He went on to say, 181 is a very big number and we will convince our members from the NASA side. So you, in this, at this point in the year 2015, I believe when this was passed, were pushing for 8% to be added on VAT. Today, you are saying you want to abolish VAT on petroleum products. Why should Kenyans believe you today? Why wouldn't they? I mean, we live in a dynamic country, and it's only fools who don't change their mind. If you are in a situation where the price of fuel has gone to 160, I mean, it's time to think. I mean, when this VAT was imposed, then the price of fuel was under 100. Honorable Ruto, when, the, price, when the VAT was um, imposed, it was at the time a condition by IMF when we were seeking a precautionary facility. Today we find ourselves in the exact same position with a third tranche of an IMF facility and once again they are calling for um, you know, the, same, the same issue that we are facing with VAT then is the same one we are facing now. And at the point IMF has in fact said that we do not need to be removing taxes on petroleum products. So with an IMF facility already in place, are you then saying you are going to go back to the IMF and renegotiate the terms of that loan that is already in place regarding IMF uh, VAT on fuel products? What's wrong with ne negotiating with IMF? I think, I think any reasonable government looking at the situation where we are, looking at the cost of living and how many Kenyans are every day sinking below the poverty line, I think it takes a courageous government to sit down with our development partners, and they are fairly reasonable people, and have a discussion. And I think they are, if, if not 8%, we need to renegotiate on some of the items that are, uh, that are outstanding. And apart from uh, looking at that, there are other instruments uh, that we can, we, can, we can deploy. For example, um, we have the fuel uh, subsidy uh, fund. We need to think about how that fund is being used, how we are deploying it. Are we deploying it correctly? Is it giving us value? And how, what changes can be made? We need an open and frank conversation with our development partners who support us, and to the best of my knowledge, they are not unreasonable. They are reasonable people, and they can entertain a conversation on negotiating some of the terms that have been offered to us. Honorable Ruto, I think that will take us into our second uh, conversation tonight, and that is on the issue of national debt, and I'd like to pick up just where you left off. Um, you say our partners um, you know, are open to renegotiation, However, on the matter of renegotiating our debt, Honorable Ruto, you just last week in an interview with the international press said you will not be entertaining discussions around renegotiating our debt. In fact, uh, with respect to your competitor who is not here with us today, when he brought up the issue, you in fact called his statement on that condescending and reckless. Mr. Deputy President, are you tonight changing your position and saying you will renegotiate and seek to restructure our debt? Not at all. I still believe, as I stand here, that it is reckless for anybody to say we cannot pay our debts. I believe that we have what it takes to pay our debts. And mark you, what we were discussing about VAT is very different from negotiating our debts. But it is tied to um, the it, IMF it is, facility, is, which, is, 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 which is, is a loan. 
is completely different. How so? What, what, we, what we cannot entertain as a country is a position that we are, we cannot pay, we cannot, we, we, we are in a position that we, we can't service our debt, we cannot, uh, we, we need to go out there and renegotiate our debt. I think that that would send the wrong signal. What I would do on matters to do with the debt, we have a plan as Kenya Kwanzaa on how to manage debt. Number one, we have said we will first slow down, put, put the brakes on borrowing. Number two, we will put brakes on unbudgeted pro uh, projects. In fact, that is the biggest source of our problem. Projects that are not within the budget so that we cannot keep our fiscal deficit at, at what we have committed, 5%. Of 5.9 percent. Number three, we need to raise our revenues. And I have said openly that we have areas that we believe that we can raise our revenue. For example, we collect 52 percent of all collectible VAT. Just by automation and computerization, we can actually raise 95% of all collectible VAT. That would give us an extra 400, 450 billion Kenya shillings. And I don't know that if you raise that kind of VAT, you can equally raise from corporate tax an additional 200, maybe 150 billion shillings. So there is room to raise additional funding, additional revenue, for us to manage our debt without necessarily going to say we're going to negotiate, uh, to negotiate our debt. So I hear you saying that our national debt as it stands today is manageable. Our national, our debt today is a challenge. We need, we need to deal with it. It's not, we're not sitting pretty. We are living, if I may say, we're living beyond our means. And that is why I am saying that we should stop this borrowing spree. Let me give you, um, in our first term, we borrowed 2.2 trillion. From 2017, our handshake brothers have borrowed 4.2 trillion. Th that's what's a source of concern. And it's not a source of concern to me. It's a source of concern to Kenyans as well. And it's even a source of concern to our development partners. They are beginning to raise issues about our debt. And more so, the trajectory of continued borrowing. So that's why I'm saying our administration will first slow down on borrowing, remove unbudgeted projects, because that's the biggest uh, incentive, and then go back to raising our own revenue. Do you and have there figures are that areas you are targeting? When you say remove unbudgeted projects, mm. how much are we talking about? When you say slow down on borrowing, from what amount to what amount are you talking about? When you look at our fiscal deficit, right, there are too many projects that are, not in the, that, that are not budgeted for. For example, uh, the Uhuru Gardens Museum. You don't see it anywhere in government budgets, but it's been built. So, so these are the kind of projects. Do you that, know how much? That, for example, I think we, in we the spend last financial close year. To, we've spent close to 15 billion in that project. In the last financial year, yeah. Honorable Deputy President, yes. do you know how much of unbudgeted projects we spent Actually, unbudgeted projects are in the region of 100 billion. Unbudgeted projects. And that is what is spiraling our borrowing. And I'm saying that our first and, and that's why, if you go today 
to the website of the Ministry of Finance, you will hardly find any paperwork there. You will hardly find any, because there are too many projects that cannot be accounted for that are being done without a budget line. If you look at the expenditure on contingency fund, which is supposed to spend only up to 5% of the budget, sometimes it goes to 50% of the budget. So, so that is where we need to apply the brakes. And we are saying clearly, we not only have a plan on slowing down on borrowing, we also have a plan on raising revenue in targeted areas, areas that would give us much more resources to run our budget, number one, and two, to also manage our repayment. And in that particular instance, you, you may want to know that almost 70, almost 80 percent of all our borrowing is actually domestic, which means we are also hurting our own enter, uh, enterprises locally. Access to credit becomes a big challenge. We must think of how we must slow down on uh, uh, borrowing locally and see how we can externalize government borrowing. And it doesn't have to be borrowing. Some of the programs, we must get the stock exchange to, up, to take up some of the um, uh, areas of raising revenue. The stock exchange is a wonderful instrument. We saw it when we were selling the shares of Safaricom. We, we were, Safaricom was looking for 50 billion. They got 250 billion. It tells you there is a lot of money out there if we used different instruments. How do we, how, how do we use the different instruments of raising capital for, 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 for long term? investment using the instruments we have, revenue, and using the stock exchange. So, so these are uh, avenues that are available for us to be able to take our development forward and minimize on borrowing. Honorable Ruto, while we stay on the issue of uh, national debt for a moment, um, for decades the Treasury has refused to make public contracts that have been signed with um, some of our lenders like the Exim Bank of China or the China Development Bank. You've been part of a government that has refused to make this information public. Why? Those contracts and agreements in accordance with the Constitution are public documents. And the public have a right to know and to have access to that information. The fact that that information is not being made, made public is against, um, is against the Constitution. So, but under yet, the Mr. Kenya Deputy Kwanzaa President, administration... You have not, um, this is something that you could do. You are the Deputy President of this Republic. Is this not something you could do or make happen? When you, are dep when you are deputy president, uh, I'm sorry you've not been one, you, you, would, understand, you would understand to what extent uh, you can do things. And um, uh, let me give you an example. Many people did not see the metal of Mwai Kibaki until he was president. When he became president, he made a sterling job of uh, being president. All along, everybody thought he was a lackluster performer. I am undertaking to the people of Kenya that given a chance to be president, things will be different in Kenya. So let me ask this just uh, one more time. Um, you are the sitting deputy president of this. Um, you say this should have happened constitutionally, uh, but it did not. Um, was this not something that came up in cabinet meetings um, that at least we've not seen you protest about this particular matter? Because debt transparency 
Um, and debt, you know, what we owe and uh, who we are paying is something that uh, taxpayers should know. So if you are saying this is something that should have happened but didn't, why would Kenyans believe you when you say that this is something you will do if elected president? Because I have never been president before. This is the first time I am vying to be president. And this is the, time, the first time I will occupy the high office of president. This is when the buck will stop with me. Are you saying, Mr. Deputy President, that in the last nine years, you have sat in cabinet meetings and expressly said that you'd like the contract's details to be released to the public? Um, I will not tell you whatever discussions uh, took place in cabinet because... What we are uh, seeking to understand, Your Excellency, because is what role it is not, played it is not in, in my making case. sure that the government that you serve is actually adhering to the Constitution and several court orders. Whenever it was available for me to take a position, I have always taken a position. And I have taken many positions. Uh, sometimes that uh, did not look uh, very uh, popular, if, if you may. And I have taken very firm positions in cabinet. And I have taken very firm positions in the public. And I think people of Kenya know me not as a coward. They, they know that I take what I believe in, uh, I believe in, and I take uh, uh, positions. I am saying here that every contract signed by the government of Kenya is a public document and it should be available to the public. The question of the SGR contract was raised even in the first term of your administration. It has never been made public. Mr. Deputy President, you don't have any record, any public record of you saying that these contracts should be made public. Why? You see, as Deputy President, there is so much that you can do. In fact, my role, my oath of office has three, four functions. Number one, I swear uh, allegiance to the people of Kenya and to the Republic to discharge every responsibility given to me by the Constitution and the law. And number three, to advise whenever required. That's the, that's the language of the Constitution. Whenever required, the President on matters that he requires advice. And number four is to serve people equally and fairly. So I have discharged that responsibility to the best of my ability. And um, I have made my position in regard to the contracts very well known to, to the right offices. It is not a matter I would have wanted to take it in public for purposes of uh, making sure that the uh, government is functional. All right, just, I have just one last question on this before we move to our next topic of discussion, um, because you've informed us about, um, from what I understand, and you can correct me, Honorable uh, Ruto, about the limited sort of powers of the Deputy President. Is that what you're saying in respect to making these, uh, uh, these contracts public? You said, and I quote, I can only do so much as a deputy president. Absolutely. Okay. Um, however, in previous television interviews, you have stated that you and the president remain accountable for everything that has been done uh, for this. So, which, which is it, Mr. Deputy President? Are you responsible for not uh, making these contracts public? Because you, in the past, have said that you and the president remain accountable and should be asked about everything that happens in this country. Precisely that's why you're asking me, and I have answered you. I have said clearly that to the extent that my duty as deputy president is concerned, I have uh, discharged my responsibility. I have given advice 
to my boss on many issues, including that particular issue. So I have given him my advice, um, enumerating very well that it is the constitutional position that every contract is made public. I have given that advice to um, the president as is required of me. So, but you know the back stops with the boss. Honorable Deputy President, let's now move to the next topic of our conversation this evening, and this will be on a matter of national security. You were recently in Elgeo Marakot County, where you promised the people of Kerio Valley that you would do everything in your power to secure them. You've also been visiting other parts of this country, Masabit, Baringo, Samburu, Laikipia, West Pokot. More than 300 people have died in the last seven months alone in this country, killed by armed bandits. Livelihoods are lost. Children have not gone to school. Children have been killed. Kerio Valley re re residents have even petitioned the UN Secretary General, saying that their government has failed to provide them with security. In your manifesto, you say that security is a cornerstone of protecting people's livelihoods. Why has the government of Kenya, in which you've served as an assistant minister, as a minister, as a deputy president, been unable to secure the people of these counties? I, I quite agree with the feeling of many Kenyans. In fact, it's, it's yesterday. It's not, it's not even uh, uh, last week. It's yesterday. I was in El Geo Marakwet. And one of the uh, leaders there told us we have buried 114 people in that neighborhood. So, so it is indeed a live and serious matter. You have seen me in um, uh, 20, when, I, when we came into office in 2016, I called all the leaders from Baringo, El Geo Marakwet, uh, Pokot, Samburu, and we had a, a serious le leaders meeting in my office in Karen. And f because, of that, because of that meeting, for about three years, we went round, we mobilized all the governors, and we provided, we, we provided um, national police reserve in all those areas. 